So with permutations, we've gotten a new kind of algebra. So of course with a new kind of algebra comes the new question. How do we simplify expressions and solve equations using this kind of algebra? In this video, I want to give a brief user's guide to how to simplify expressions and solve equations using permutations written in cycle notation. And in particular, we're going to look at how to do two things. First of all, how to simplify a product, that is a composition of two permutations. And secondly, how do I determine the inverse of a permutation, which would be the tool necessary to solve an equation in this algebraic setting. So let's figure out how to simplify and also how to invert permutations using cycle notation. I want to do that using these couple of examples. So first I have a product of two four cycles. And this is an interesting simplification problem precisely because those four cycles are not disjoint from one another. They're both making claims at moving elements like one and two, right? They appear in both of those four cycles. So how do I simplify this product when those cycles interact with one another? That's really what gives us the level of difficulty that it has. Um, and then secondly, I want to find out how to invert this five cycle, one, six, three, eight, five. Um, we're going to do this in a couple of steps. We're first going to really unpack what's happening in this composition of permutations using stack notation. And then we're going to see sort of what's the rule of thumb to do this with just the cycles without having to write out the stacks every time. But the first comment I want to make is a word of caution. And this is a word of caution that I myself have struggled to heed <laughs> sometimes. Um, keep in mind that we've defined permutations as functions bijective functions from a set of n elements to the same set of n elements. And because they're functions, when I write down two permutations next to one another, what I really mean is I really mean a composition of two functions. This function uh, composed with that function. So f circle g, if you like. Well, the thing about composing functions is that they compose in a fashion that algebraists call a contravariant ordering. And what I mean by contravariant ordering is if I write down two permutations, sigma circle tau, sigma composed with tau, what that means is that tau is going to act on some arrangement of letters or elements or some set, right? Tau is going to act first, and then the result of tau is going to get fed into sigma. So when I write down sigma circle tau, what I really mean is that first the permutation tau is happening, and then the result of tau is being fed into sigma. So tau acts first, sigma acts second. What that means is when I write down a product of permutations, it's really a composition of functions, and that means I should be interpreting it as reading from right to left. So this permutation up here really means first 1872 is going to happen, and then the result of that permutation is going to be fed into the input of the permutation 1325. So we read compositions of permutations from right to left. Compare this with what we do again with function composition. F circle G is a function in which G happens first, and then the result of G is then fed into F. Similarly with matrix multiplication. When we're using the column vector formalism for linear algebra, then when I write down a product of two matrices M times T, it means that T is acting on the vector first, and then M is acting on the result. The contrast to this, to a covariant ordering, sorry, a contravariant ordering, is what's called a covariant ordering. So we could develop linear algebra, we could have developed function composition, we could have developed all of these topics in ways that we could read them from left to right, uh, instead of from right to left, but that would require some other complications that I'm not ready to get into in this video. For example, in linear algebra, we'd have to represent our vectors as rows instead of as columns, and we'd have to change the, the processes by which we multiply matrices. So everything in linear algebra, for example, is powered by this assumption that matrices are acting on the left of vectors, and that's where the contravariant ordering comes from. So all of that is just a backstory to say, when you read a composition of permutations, always read it from right to left, with the rightmost one happening first. So enough backstory. How do we actually simplify this product of two permutations, in which now we've agreed that 1872 is the permutation happening first, and 1325 is then happening to the output of that first permutation. So again, let's look at it first from the point of view of using the stack notation, and then second, we'll learn the shortcut for how to do it with just the cycles on the page. So first, let's write down the stack notation for each of these two permutations, 1872 and 1325. And then what we want to do is run both of these permutations in series. Run this first one first, and then feed the output of the first into the input of the second. So what's the stack notation for 1872? Well, according to how cycle notation works, 
position 1 is going to end up in position 8. And in turn, 8 is going to end up in position 7. 7 is going to end up in position 2. And 2 is going to wrap back around to position 1. So there's what's happened in this first permutation. This is also a good time to notice what's not happening. Positions 3, 4, 5, and 6 are all staying put. We call those positions in this permutation fixed. Anytime a mathematician uses the word fixed, what they mean is something that's not being changed by the action of a function. So 3, 4, 5, and 6 are fixed elements under this permutation. So that's what's happening with 1, 8, 7, 2. We'll get the stack notation for 1, 3, 2, 5 similarly. 1 goes to position 3, 3 goes to position 2, 2 goes to position 5, and 5 wraps back around to position 1. Meanwhile, 4, 6, 7, and 8 for this permutation are fixed elements. So now how do we compose these two permutations together? Again, as with any function composition, this composition means we're feeding the output of the first function into the input of the second function. What that means in our stack notation is that all of the outputs that I got from 1872 over here are now going to become the new inputs for my second permutation. So rather than using 1 through 8 in uh, linear order here in my second permutation, I'm going to write instead 2, 7, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, and 1 in those inputs. And then all I have to do is trace what happens to what used to be 1 and is now 2 is going to end up in the position where 1 used to end up. Now I'm going to have a 2 there instead. Similarly, my second position is now beginning as a 7 in the second permutation. And so wherever 2 used to go, that's now going to become a 7 instead. Similarly for position 3 is going to carry through. Position 4 remains fixed. 5, the new 5 is the same as the old 5. Uh, the new 6 is the same as the old 6. The new 8 is the same as the old 8. The new, uh, sorry, the new uh, 8 becomes the position where 7 used to be. 1 is now in the position where 8 used to be. So I hope it's clear what I'm doing, that I'm taking each of the outputs from my first permutation and just tracing it through my second permutation so that now what I get is a different set of elements on my bottom row. And so in stack notation, what this composition would look like is it's the result of starting at the very beginning and ending up at the very end. So at the beginning, I had 1 through 8 in a linear order. And at the end here, I have 5, 3, 2, 4, 7, 6, 8, 1. So in stack notation, that's what this looks like. And when I've composed it, what I'm really kind of doing is I'm kind of blurring what's happening here in the middle. Right? When I'm looking at the composition, I just care about the very beginning and the very end. And there happens to be something else happening in the middle, but the composition, at the end of the day, doesn't see that. So that's the complete visual of what's happening when I compose two permutations together. But if I don't want to go through that whole process of writing out the cycles every time, writing out the stacks every time, how can I do it with just the cycle notation? This is probably how most practitioners uh, handle the process of composing permutations. And the key here is that I want to take each position and just trace its path through this composition. For example, I want to take position 1 and ask what's happening when I compose these two cycles together. If I trace 1 through my stacks that I have on the left, I find out that 1 first ends up in position 8, and then when I feed it down here, it ends up remaining in position 8. We can see that from the cycle notation as well, starting from the cycle written on the right, and then moving to the cycle written on the left. Remember, permutations act in a contravariant ordering, with the permutation on the right happening, and then the permutation on the left. So what's happening to 1? It's first going to position 8, and then it's remaining at position 8, because this cycle doesn't do anything to position 8. And so that's what's happening to 1. Position 2, meanwhile, is going to position 1 by virtue of this first cycle that's acting over here. And then, after that, position 1 is landing in position 3. So 2 goes to 1, which then goes to 3. And in our stacks, we can see that happening as well. So ultimately, 2 ends up going to 3. 3, meanwhile, doesn't do anything in my first permutation, but in my second permutation, it nudges one step over to go to position 2. So ultimately, 3 goes to 2. We can see that happening in the stack also. 4 is completely untouched by both of these permutations, so it remains at 4. 5 isn't touched by the first permutation, but in the second step, it goes back to 1. We can see that happening in the stack also. 6, completely above the fray. Nothing happens to 6. 7 goes to position 2 in the first step, 
which then goes to position 5 in the second step. So ultimately, 7 goes to 5. We can see that happening over there. And finally, 8 goes to position 7 in the first step, and nothing happens to position 7 in the second step. So 8 ends up at 7. And what's great about this is now that I've traced all of these steps through from beginning to end, I can come up with cycle notation for this product, and the process by which I do so is going to give me a product of disjoint cycles, which is ultimately what we want. Every permutation can be expressed sort of most usefully as a product of disjoint cycles. So to get that, let's start with position 1 and find out what happens to it. Just trace the, its path through here. 1 goes to 8, according to this first line. And then, the next in my cycle, I have to figure out where 8 goes. 8 goes to 7. Next in the cycle, where does 7 go? 7 goes to 5. The next in the cycle is the question, where does 5 go? 5 goes back to 1, but that wraps me back around to close off the 4 cycle, 1, 8, 7, 5. So 1, 8, 7, 5 describes a good chunk of what's going on in this composition of two permutations. But I still have some leftovers. So the next question is, what's happening to 2? Well, 2 goes to 1, which goes to 3. So ultimately, 2 goes to 3. Where does 3 go next in the cycle? 3 goes back to 2, which means I've closed off my cycle once again. Notice now again that these two cycles that are becoming part of my composition are disjoint. So it didn't matter that I wrote them in this order. I could have written them in the other order if I wanted to, and I would still have the same permutation. If I were being really explicit, I would also write these little 1 cycles. 4 ends up at 4. So that's a single one cycle. Six ends up at six, also a one cycle. But each of those is an identity permutation, so I can choose not to write it as well. And now I have a complete description of this composition of two permutations expressed as a product of disjoint cycles. And because they're disjoint, I could also have written them in the other order as well, because disjoint cycles commute. So this gives us a process now, and I recommend once you get accustomed to using the, the cycle notation, um, that that's probably the one that you ultimately want to use. Um, but this product is always going to give us a product of disjoint cycles at the end of the day. So that's the lowdown on simplifying products of cycles inside of uh, permutations. The next question is, how do I determine the inverse of a cycle? That's what we'll do quickly in the next video.